from people to people, we would send out runners who would go and they would deliver messages so that we could always have a form of communication with each other. And so that's always been something that's been in our culture. And so like there's like spiritual one, which that, that one was a spiritual one. Everybody felt that in their hearts and it opened up the minds and the spirits of everybody who saw that. So you said spiritual. It was along the corridor of this whole project. It was along where the pipeline was supposed to be routed, which came across the original Trinity Territory land. And to kind of show you some history on why that was taken, and why they keep telling our people that this government and this, this these people that are for you know fossil fuels, they keep telling our people that you know we're you guys ate for the national interest of this country. They keep telling our people that. So I have to go and tell them our story. So they better understand that our people has given up so much to this national interest, whether they understand that or not. And just, I want to share a story with you. Just a couple of little things. Just this, this happened all over the country, the native nations, all over. The government, I always gotta remember, our government was founded on violence. Do things in the violent way. Yeah. What I want to tell you is 1868 was our last thing, our seven council fires. All signed off. A peace treaty with the government, which had over 60 million acres of land, 60 million we were afforded by that treaty. Why, why can I ask you something? Why did they decide to make a treaty with you? Because they just wanted to end the wars. They said, if you stay on this delegated land, we'll leave you alone, you leave us alone, and you can continue your, your way of life. Because you were beating them. Absolutely. <laughs> But I just want to continue on with the history. 1877, really quickly, I'm trying to get through this as fast as I can, but I want you to really understand this. 1877, Ulysses S. Grant, we all know that president, did an executive order to take our Black Hills from our people. And why they took the Black Hills from our people? Because of the great Western migration, they found gold in the California that part of the country. So they had migration from the east coast to the west coast. And while they were doing that, they found gold on our land. So they did, in the, in the original treaty agreement, they were supposed to supply us with food rations, health care, all these different things to live on this land. So in 1877, when Ulysses S. Grant did the executive order to confiscate the Black Hills from our people, they, act, they did an act of Congress, and this is the actual name, it was called the Act or Starve Bill. So what they did was, they said, you know what, we agreed to your treaty, we're going to help you supply all these things until the grass grows and the river flows, that's how long that treaty is supposed to be, it's infinite. That's all states said in it. And they're supposed to provide us with these things. So they said, you know what, we're going to pull all your rations if you don't let us take these Black Hills. So that's why that Act Our Star Bill was created and passed by Congress. And you heard Amy Goodman say consultation? At one time, they never ever did consultation with Native Nations. Many times. They just did it and took our Black Hills away from us, which they generate millions of dollars off of state parks in tourist attractions in the state of South Dakota today, which is where you see the Mount Rushmore, all the presidents, right? Yeah. That's on our land. And why was that land important to you? Because that's the most sacredest place we call on Turtle Island. There's a reason why where we live is in the center of Turtle Island. We're in the center. The Black Hills are in the center. And what's Turtle Island? Turtle Island is the North American continent. You ever look at the shape of it? It looks like a turtle. And so what, what happened? What, how much gold did they take out of those hills? So to my recollection, it was over $3 trillion of gold they took out of there. But I'll get to that story as I move forward. 
on what they offered us later on. Okay, I'm why, why money is not important to our people, and I'll, I'll tell you that. But, but 1889, they shrunk us down into reservations of what you see standing here off today because of things like the camp. Because of the camp, the government and the people don't like when Indian people gather. It's always the history would tell us that they get scared when we gather. Oh, what are they going to do? You know? So they have to separate us in different reservations. Our Ocheque should go in 1889 is how we became our standing rock boundaries in which we see today. Which, again, it took more acres of land away, separated us, and put us on these specific areas of land. It separated our people. The government did that without our consultation, without approval, again, of our, my nation. So let me go back to when I say national interest of this country. You guys don't like the national interest of this country. You're not helping us. What did we give to this country? $3 trillion of gold. Moving forward, just to do a, one couple more examples, which is better known as the Pink Sloan Act. And we're able to grow things and stay warm in the low-lying areas of our land. The Corps of Engineers and the government, once again, without consultation, flooded our communities. In the community I represent, Cannonball, flooded us out and took over 300 of our homes and we had to rebuild. And why they did that? It's because now they're using our land where our people were buried our bones and our ancestors have risen off that river. And all they do is they give us a number and they throw all the pile of bones in there. And that's where our ancestors are, some of them that were buried on that low line area are today. The government did that, once again. And why they did So when I always go back to this saying, first it was our land. They tried to kill our food source lot, our buffalo. Now today, they're coming after our water. That's why it's so significant moving forward and why you need to know the history. And when we say whatever we have left for our people on standing ground, we have to preserve that now. We're not against the national interest of this country. We never have been. We're a giving people, but we have no more left to give. And those are the histories that people need to understand moving forward and why it's so significant on why we're there today. Just to share one last fact for you leading up to this point before we move on to the current events today and what's happening out there is our way of life, like Tokata says, she's 13 years old. Our way of life is to teach our young ones our history, our culture, our ways of life. So they know who they are, where they come from. That's why it's so important. 130 years ago, our great Sioux nation was the only people to ever defeat the U.S. government in battle on U.S. soil. I don't know if you ever knew that. Up the little big one, our people. <laughs> and they're saying, how did we do that? People were telling us we have overwhelmingly odds against us. How did you guys do that? Because our government, 130 years ago, now to today, now we have to battle the government again in a different way. We did the same protocol. We set up our council lodge in July on the overflow camp, which is they called the Ochente Shakoin camp at that time. We set that council lodge up. We followed the same protocol as we did in our history, in our way of life. We followed those same protocols. And when we did that, in that ceremony, they told us, we need to, if we're going to win, the only way we're going to win is if we move forward with peace and prayer. That's the only way we're going to win this fight. So moving forward today, we continue to do that. Peace and prayer and you'll win. And I remind everybody that's a part of this whole movement to move forward in peace and prayer wherever you may be when you're associated with Standing Rock in this movement. Once again, we're guided by protocol. Once again, we were told if we do this, we'll win. 
And when that decision came on December 4th, and I understand it's not open, but we just got to continue to follow the guidance of the Creator, and we'll win. That's why it's so significant today on why our culture is so important to share, like Mark said, to learn, and to teach the people once again how to live. I think here in New York State, we fought off the fracking industry. Um, we, 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 in this very room, we uh, campaigned hard, we organized hard for nearly a decade, and we banned fracking. Um, and uh, this fight is a fight against fracking because it's fracked oil coming out of Western North Dakota. It's also a fight about climate change, but it's principally a fight about indigenous sovereignty. And it occurs to me that something really new has been created in these camps. Um, the protest camp of Otepi Sakon and Sacred Stone. And that something incredible has happened there in this alliance of all these different parts of the movement. I wanted to just ask if you could paint a picture for these people who haven't been there. What happens on a daily basis there? Obviously there are protests that are constantly happening or protection ceremonies. I don't know how you would describe it. but. There are very significant actions, but also about the values of the camps and the values, the indigenous values that are coming through, um, that are teaching us um, in the justice movement, the environmental movement, the movement against environmental racism. What do these camps have to teach us? Because I think you've been both very incredibly vocal advocates of that, se that sense of values and what we have to do now, because I think it's giving us new life and new breath a new energy in the movement that we are all a part of. Can you speak a bit about what it's like there and what, what, what do they stand for for you? Yes. So the, what, the, what the camp is doing right now is providing a, a focal point for an international spiritual monument. We, ha we have worldviews, we have knowledges we have metaphysics and epistemologies, cosmologies, mythologies, all of these things that we know, we've known them for tens of thousands of years. <clears throat> we've known that the air is our breath. We call that grandfather's breath. We know that the water is the bloodline of Mother Earth and the bloodline of the universe. These are spiritually liberating concepts that have to happen up here. They have to happen here and here. Because what we are trying to teach people is that not just brown Indians were colonized, but mm. everybody of every phenotype yes. was colonized. Everybody had their mind separated from their spirit their labor separated from me. This is what we're up against, is this usurpation that capital, the logic of capital and debt, and what that really means for our modern societies. We're trying to communicate that to the world because we need a different value system, one that values water resources. We can holler all day about water being sacred, and show you scientifically how it dances when you sing to it. Mm. But maybe you're on a level where you have to understand it's good business to protect water because water is national security. Oh. All economic value of any form derives from water and its security. So we're trying to get that out. People are freezing out there on the front line right now. All the people you saw up here in the beginning those are all frontline warriors that I'm honored to call friends and brothers. So right now, we're witnessing an intense brutalization. And it's like we're the new ghost dancers. And today, 126 Who, years ago... Today, uh, 126 years ago, 
sitting bull was assassinated on this day. And the ghost dance was a movement to revive our power and revive uh, the old ways. But only this time, we're not alone. We have a world of allies. That's why it's important that you're here. It's important that you hear, it's important that you hear our truths and you share your truths. You have networks that we don't have. We have networks you might not have. But we have to join together and strengthen it because we're all in this together. They're coming after us right now, but in this process, they're coming after your constitutional rights. I've seen some remarkable things. I've seen lines of water protectors walk directly up to police who were uh, militarized police with full riot gear, with tear gas, with rubber bullets, with M4 rifles, with zip ties, with, with uh, concussion grenades, and talk to them and say, we love you, we're protecting your kids' water as well. And it's a big debate uh, at the camp itself that I've heard, how best are we to love these police? Isn't, I mean, that's mind-blowing. Can you talk a little bit, um, anyone on, on, uh, about this idea of, you know, love your enemy, love the people who you're fighting against? How does that happen internally? What does that mean? Well, the understand that we're not just fighting for our water. We're fighting for their water, too. Um, it should be obvious because water is life. Everybody needs water. Every living thing on this planet needs water to live. And something as simple as that is being overturned by this greed. And I just don't know how to explain it. Like, we had a march, we were, or a run, we were running and to the Capitol to just get our voices out. And keep in mind that the majority of us, like 80% of us, are women and children. We are met at the Capitol by armed riot police. Kids have to go up there just trying to speak, just trying to like speak, let them know what, what is happening. And we are met there with 60 armed police who are acting like these children are terrorizers. And just that image of children standing there next to these police who seem to have no emotion. I don't understand how a human being can treat another human being in that way. I watched them simply just mace the whole lot and pepper spray the whole lot. I have a badass in her own right. <laughs> seven to 10 degrees, and they water blasted everybody. I got water blasted. And then I left probably about two in the morning, and two hours later is when Sophia Walansky had her arm blown wide open by some explosive device that was deployed by law enforcement. The very next day, law enforcement, and this is how it is in North Dakota, you gotta understand, North Dakota is its own little animal, okay? They, the law enforcement literally sends press releases to the media and goes out as the truth. So they claimed two things. One, that they did not use explosive that night. And thankfully that was refuted by video evidence. They tried to blame Sophia. They tried to blame Sophia for her own injury, claiming that she had improvised some explosive device. The second thing, they said they only used water cannons or water hoses to put out fires that the protesters had started. Thankfully, again, that was refuted by video evidence. That's what we mean when things are different now. We have our own media networks to tell the truth. One of the, there was a camera woman working with Josh 
got shot by a rubber bullet. Like she was live streaming it and they just shot her. So things are really, I mean, they're intense out there. It changes you when you're out there. And it's for the better. Because we all, I mean, we don't know what we're facing the next four years. We don't have to talk about all of that right now, but we are facing a, 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 an attack and a degradation on our very democracy. And if we don't stand up, somebody else without our best interest in mind is going to determine our destiny. And we've got to stop that. So, in prayer, he got the message, peaceful water protection, right? That's how you're going to win. Is that still the way forward? When, what, how do you stay peaceful when people are spraying the women in your life your friends, when they're beating them, when they're hitting them with rubber bullets, when they're putting them in dog cages and writing numbers on their bodies to signify what number they are in the system. They put the, the old elders take their clothes off and humiliate them. How do you stay peaceful, man? <laughs> That's a good question. To get that kind of aggression all the time. How do you do it? Let us know. <laughs> well, here's, here's kind of a, a, a story. Why I, I, I truly believe, I always say this, and we always heard this term before, is things don't happen by chance. Things always happen for a reason. There's a reason why Standing Rock was chosen. There's a reason why Bismarck didn't want it. They tried to put it there. There's a reason why there was a big uproar of movement led by a, a certain type of culture and a certain type of people. All that is, is, you put that all together, you'll better understand why. I always truly was told by a lot of elders that the Creator created us in a certain way where we can take so much atrocity and so much genocide over the years and so much things that have happened to our people. He created a certain spirit about us. He created us in a unique way where our spirit will never be broken. And I truly believe that that spirit is still held within our people every day. And it's carried on from our ancestors because of our culture and who we are and our way of life. That's why this movement, I believe, truly believe, started with the native people because our spirit, if you think about it, our history would tell us they try to exterminate our race. For so many thousands of years, they try to get rid of us. They couldn't do it. They tried to take our food. That didn't work. Try to kill all our buffalo. Try to take our land. They try to separate us to break our spirit. So hopefully we'll lose our culture and our way of life. But you know what? No matter what you do, because of our way of life and because who we are as a people, and because of we're the first peoples of this land which we are on today, that will tell you that our spirit can never be broken. Never. Never has our spirit ever, ever been broken. And that's why our people are up there on the front line. That's why you've seen young people in our youth. It's in our genes. We're really resilient type of people where we can take a lot. But you know what? We're the most givingest people in the world as well. That's the reason why we're able to take that, because who we are as a people. Can you... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> were, were, not, were there not some, or, 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 or other people of color? I mean, you know... Were, were those folks not on the front lines with you too? Were they not also standing in solidarity? Did they not take the beatings and the bullets and the maces? And the, Did they not have a bit of that spirit in them too? Absolutely, and that's what I'm saying, is that there are also other races there. But when they come to stand... ...phone call was the fact that this pipeline was originally meant to be built in Bismarck, North Dakota, mm -hmm. a predominantly white community. And the community and the people in Bismarck decided that when that pipeline breaks, 
It would compromise the integrity of their drinking water. So instead of building it there, they moved the pipeline to Standing Rock Reservation. And that got me so angry <laughs> because it's the same to like drop everything that they were doing and to, to drive to Ohio to learn um, a bunch of, from a bunch of Native American kids about what was going on in their land. And when we got there, we were so moved and so um, transformed by, like what Cody was saying, by learning about the spiritual ways of, of these people. And the same spiritual ways that people that living is on the right, it's just who these people are, who you guys are. You do recognize that your um, that our bodies aren't made from the soil. We're not going to save this earth. We can't protect this earth. Like all of the the slogans as activists that we use constantly are as environmentalists. Every cent in your bank account 
if you're in one of those banks, is going to the other side, right? Because your money doesn't just stay in a box and you have a, an investment or whatever in a bank, bank account. I'm assuming people here have bank accounts, probably a couple of bank accounts. And if you don't take that money out, those banks use that money when you're not looking to do things like fund the Dakota Access Pipeline. So I want everybody here today to take a pledge. You're taking your money out of those banks. Because when we take our money out of those banks, we send a message to the bankers, we know what you're doing. Because you don't have money. If you have money in Bank of America, or Chase, or Citibank, or TD, or Wells Fargo, and there's a whole long list, you don't have money in the bank account. You've got rubber bullets in the bank account that are being shot at these people. You've got tear gas that is being sprayed at the water protectors. You've got concussion grenades being hurled at your fellow New Yorkers. That's what's in the bank. You have an oil spill happening when you put that ATM card in. That has become an act of violence. That is our system. So we went in there today. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch of live streams uh, with the drummers in the bank. Banks actually have pretty good acoustics. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, you know, I mean, they shut down all the music clubs in New York City, shut down CBGBs, but we had the club in the bank today. Um, that was, I suggest we may do this in the future. Um, but tr tr truthfully, you must take the money out of those banks, and that was the message from today. I'd, I'd like anybody to weigh in on how do we defund the DAP will defund Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, can, we, can we elaborate on this? Because um, it's, a, it's a necessity. Think about what you spent to be here today. And then think about what you have in the bank. You know what I mean? Think, and there are good options. Carver, Blackburn Bank in New York, Amalgamated. There's a list of banks that are not funding fossil fuel projects. And you must transfer. It's easy. And live stream it when you do. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, and it's very important. Because that's what, when we talk about the Occupy movement, Black Lives Matter, we talk about any movement. That it, we're up, what we're up against is not a human thing. We, we've, we've exited the point where people of one color or phenotype oppress another people of another phenotype. We're dealing with a system that is, has the potential and is oppressing every living thing. So as human beings, if we wake up and realize that we can use currency, whether it's fiat or whatever, as a tool to guide the way we want our leadership to act, they fear that if they know that we'll move our money. And that's what we need to do. Everybody in here has networks that they can activate to move their money. So defund DAPL, defund D-A-P-L dot O-R-G. And you can sign up and I'll tell you how to do it, where to put your money places that are safe to put your money. Uh, in the next week or so, there's going to be a lot of this going on. You're going to see a lot more action that you saw happen today. And, and I'm telling you today, tune in next week sometime. A very big, important celebrity will be taking their money out of a big, mean bank. And... This is real. Look, we can stop this pipeline by doing this. You want to know how we can stop it? We stop it by doing this. Yeah. This is the soft, gooey underbody, yes. underbelly of the beast, of the black snake. And, and the more pressure we put on them financially, the harder it is to move forward. It doesn't mean a damn thing what Trump does. This is our pathway to stopping this freaking pipeline. I'm telling you, you want to stop it, put financial pressure on them. And I know there's people in this room that have relationships with these banks, and they could call them tomorrow and say, I'm taking every dime out of this bank if by the 21st you guys haven't made a formal statement to take the money out of this bank. Brutal, bloodless taking of our health and the health of our future generations. What do we do now? What do we do now? What do you want to see happen? What, how do we move forward? This is a fundraiser, so we're going to have to ask you for money at some point. I don't want to keep you here all night. 
I'd rather just get the money. <laughs> I'm going to give you crap. I, I'm so grateful. You're, this is what you're my funniest post of an anti fossil fuel kind of We need it. We need a little bit of laughter sometimes to get through the brutality that I'm facing. Can you repeat the website? Yeah, we have a video, right? Can I show this video? And we'll talk about it. And then that was asked about the website. Defundapple.org, isn't that it? Yes. Defund and DAPL.org. Just got uh, a blanket and a towel, and I just headed out. At times, it got discouraging. Like, you wanted to leave. Like, 